So if you've been anywhere near a social media platform for the last three or four days, well, at least as of the recording of this video, you've probably heard about the manga we're going to talk about today. There is one manga and one manga alone being talked about on every single social media platform, and that manga has one chapter out. And what is this one manga that's sweeping the entire nation that people are already claiming is better than the likes of the entirety of the big three? Well, that would be none other than Kagurabachi. Kagurabachi started making headlines a couple of days ago because it was featured on the cover of Shonen Jump. However, in a world where new manga are really a dime in a dozen, just having slightly cool cover art to grace the front of Shonen Jump's weekly issue where Kagurabachi was officially released shouldn't have been enough to keep this manga alive. And yet a level of hype started to surround this manga that I haven't seen for the first chapter of a manga maybe ever. See, because while the hype surrounding Kagurabachi started very organic, with people being excited about the main character's design and even the plot of the first chapter, the hype surrounding Kagurabachi has descended into complete and utter madness. And while of course TikTok's FYP is very tailored towards you, and therefore anything that I see probably isn't a reflection of what you see, but I know that the entirety of my FYP is people currently memeing Kagurabachi to be the greatest anything of all time. Memes like photos of chocolate chip ice cream saying I'm the greatest ice cream then chocolate ice cream saying no I'm the greatest ice cream and then the final slide being no I'm the greatest ice cream and it's just Chihiro the main character of this manga standing in a cone. The meme that enough time has passed that people have already began to dub Kakurabachi is better than One Piece which started as organic hype building around a really interesting looking and fast paced manga has devolved into possibly the greatest marketing scheme for this manga possible, which could either very easily set up the next biggest manga on earth, or maybe one of the biggest disappointments we've ever seen. See, because here's the thing, chapter one of Black Clover, One Punch Man, MHA, Chainsaw Man, none of them generated the level of hype that Kagurabachi is currently generating. And while well, obviously a lot of the hype revolved around Kagurabachi is by people who haven't even read the first chapter, the fact that a manga is one chapter into its story and is trending on every single social media means that it has a pretty good chance chance of being successful. Because personally, I have a rule that I don't read a manga until it gets 10 chapters in. Because like I've already stated, manga are a dime in a dozen. And if you read manga before they hit chapter 10, about 50% of them just straight up get cancelled. This is why I just started reading Goku Raku Gai. Because it got its 11th chapter, and not until I see 11 chapters do I deem that a manga is worth reading. But I decided to throw my own rule to the wayside because Kagurabachi is the biggest thing in the manga world right now. And I wanted to see if the hype being generated around Kagurabachi was justified. So I sat down and I read the chapter and honestly, I feel as though the hype might actually be justified. While the plot of the story doesn't appear to be anything particularly special, the motives and central tenets of the story are very simple, the action is quick paced, and the art style is pretty good. For all intents and purposes, the first chapter of Kagurabachi checks all of the boxes to be a successful shounen for the next 10 or so years. That is between its manga run and hypothetical anime run. It's a gory revenge story revolving around super-powered katanas. Nothing about it breaks any molds whatsoever, however, formulaic is what works. So today, I want to go over this first chapter with you and give you my honest thoughts on it and whether or not I believe Kagurabachi will turn into one of the biggest manga on earth and maybe in anime one day. Or if the hype revolving around chapter two is just a flash in the pan. But before we get to reviewing anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you guys love the idea of me giving you manga recommendations, you are going to love my anime podcast, Who Talks Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you want to look like somebody who keeps up to date on new releases of manga, go ahead and head to my brand new merch store, TalkasAnonymous.net, where you can get some of the greatest anime merch known to man. So, Kagurabachi. What? is it? What's it about? What's the power system? Will it hold up? Is it worth your time? Well, I believe before we answer the subjective questions, like, is it worth your time? Will it hold up? Will it run to its ending? We should cover the concrete topics first. So let's start this video off in the way that we tend to start these kinds of videos off. 
by answering the easy questions. So Kagurabachi, what is it? What's it about? Well, Kagurabachi's main character is a boy by the name of Chihiro, and Chihiro grows up in a swordsmith family. That is to say that Chihiro lives alone with his father, who is a legendary swordsmith. And as the only person in Chihiro's life is his father, Chihiro grows up idolizing his father, wanting to be just like him. But more importantly than anything else, Chihiro wants to grow up and do the same thing as his father, which is be a swordsmith of of legendary renown. And for all intents and purposes, it appears as though Chihiro is on the path of accomplishing that, as Chihiro has spent every single day of his life working with his father crafting katana. And in this capacity, we have a story that's eerily familiar to Demon Slayer. But Chihiro, much like Tanjiro, grows up idolizing his father and wants to do what his father did, which was cut down trees, burn them, create charcoal, and then sell that charcoal. However, instead of doing something simple like burning wood and selling it, Chihiro wants to learn his father's world-renowned craftsmanship. Though, I mean, I guess being a charcoal salesman probably does have some crafts involved as well. Now, in the beginning of the chapter, it appears as though Chihiro's father, Kunshigi, is a world-renowned katana maker because of the quality of katana that he makes. As pretty much all that we're told is that he was a world-renowned katana craftsman because of the unique method he uses to create his katana. So, so far as we know, he just makes really sharp or really durable swords. We later learned that that's actually not the circumstance, but we'll get to that bridge when we cross it. Now, outside of Chihiro respecting his father as a craftsman, he also also respects him as a father and a person, as it's shown that his father is a naturally very silly person when he's not crafting katana, a man who on his way home would pick up goldfish for the house that he and his son could raise together. But outside of crafting katanas, he's shown to be quite airheaded, a silly goofy guy. When he locks into a serious mode while crafting katanas, all of that goes away. Honestly, he feels exactly like Ishin Kurosaki from Bleach, serious when he needs to be silly most of the time. And one day, while Chihiro and his father are in the middle of creating a katana, it an old acquaintance of his father stops by. This acquaintance goes by Mr. Shiba. Now it's revealed to us that Mr. Shiba and Chihiro's father are old friends. And since Chihiro and his father live out in the boonies making swords, occasionally Mr. Shiba will stop by with souvenirs for them. Now, Mr. Shiba very conveniently acts as an exposition vehicle, explaining to Chihiro, basically explaining to us, that Chihiro's father was one of the most famous people in the world during the war, specifically the Saite War. Now, a war being called the Saite War is kind of interesting, because the word Saite actually has a lot to do with swordsmanship. See, in order to introduce what Saite is, I have to introduce another concept, and that concept is Iaido. Now, Iaido is a Japanese martial arts that's centric around pulling your sword out of its scabbard quickly and slashing. In an anime and modern day culture, Iaido is usually just referred to as Ei. Some prominent users of Ei or Ei influenced techniques are Zenitsu, with his thunderclap and flash, where he pulls his sword out of his katana very quickly, and Nobunaga, from Hunter Hunter with his N-based EI slashes. Now, there are 12 accepted forms of Eido. You know how we have different forms of flame breathing or mist breathing or lightning breathing? That's based off the real-life Japanese principle called Saite Gata Techniques. And within Eido, there are Saite Gata Techniques. Now, what Demon Slayer would call forms are technically referred to as Kata in Japanese. But these Kata fall under the umbrella of Saite Gata Techniques. So the war being referred to as the Saite War is actually a reference to Iaido and its techniques, which actually makes sense when we consider the end of this chapter, but we'll get there when we get there. But sorry, before we went off on this long historical tangent about Japanese martial arts, we were talking about the fact that Chihiro's father was a man of legendary renown during the Saite War, even more famous than people who fought in the war like Mr. Shiba. And thus we've established the fact that Chihiro's father was a non-combatant and Mr. Shiba was a combatant. But Mr. Shiba elucidates to Chihiro that the swords that his father father made were the reason the war ended, obviously for the side that Mr. Shiba was fighting for. Now, after Mr. Shiba leaves, Chihiro's father very conveniently says, well, you're 15 now, which means you need to learn the dark side of swordsmithing. To which Chihiro states, I'm willing to learn about all aspects of swordsmithing because I'm serious about following your footsteps. At which point we get a real Chekhov's gun moment, as Chihiro's father ushers him down to the basement where there is one katana sitting on a stand. And it's at this point that Chihiro's father reveals to Chihiro that there is a couple of katana scattered around the basement. All katana made before Chihiro was born that were used in the war. It's at this point that we get a talk that great power comes with great responsibility as Chihiro's father tells Chihiro that we have as much blood on our hands as swordsmiths as the people who use our swords to cut down enemies. And while sometimes our swords may be used to slash open new eras or save lives, other times our swords will end up in the hands of the wrong people. And as swordsmiths, we have to be able to bear that weight. To which Chihiro says that he doesn't know if 
if he'll be able to bear that weight, but he knows he wants to try. Which is a good enough answer for Chihiro's father, so they move on. But how far do they move on? Great question. How about 38 months into the future? Because after this conversation between Chihiro and his father, we get a time skip. 26 pages into the manga. And 38 months, for those of you who can't divide by 12, is three years in two months. So Chihiro is now at least 18. And what is the first scene that we see 38 months later? Well, it's the Yakuza cutting down some innocents. See, apparently the town that Chihiro and his father live outside of has been taken over by a group of criminals referred to as the Korogumi Yakuza. However, within that town, there's some people who are trying to drive out the Yakuza, but the Yakuza doesn't really like that. So they're cutting down all these people who put up flyers trying to rally people to drive them out of town. And based off the fact that none of them have guns, but the main leader of the Yakuza has I, I, mutton chops? Is that what you call that? When it's like a mustache that attaches into like kind of a beard here and goes up? It's very much like a, come here, you, that was bullied. Now you have to have fisticuffs with me type of facial hair. And considering the fact that nobody in the Yakuza has guns and that the main member of the Yakuza has some 1910s ass facial hair, I'm gonna assume we're somewhere in the early 1900s in Kagadabachi. Maybe in the late 1800s because guns didn't become popular or even used at all in Japan until roughly World War I. However, while the Yakuza is beating down on this last remaining member of the people who put up posters trying to drive them out of town, it's revealed those of the Korogumi Yakuza is backed by a sorcerer. And just like that, there's magic. And just so fast as the concept of sorcery is introduced, wouldn't you believe it, a sorcerer shows up and grows a tree around the neck of the last remaining member of the people who put up the posters to drive out the Yakuza. Now I know what you're saying, oh, he grew a tree, but the tree is pointy. Specifically, he grows a bonsai tree, but instead of the bonsai tree having leaves, it has needles that are digging into his face. It's not a pleasant experience for anybody. And then just as fast as that sorcerer shows up, he puts two fingers together and burns away into flames and disappears. We know a man who knows exactly his cue to leave. After it's very clearly been depicted who the bad guys were, we're served to our first look at Chihiro post time skip. And things have changed. One, Chihiro is on a train with Mr. Shiva. His father is nowhere to be seen. Two, Chihiro now has a massive X-shaped scar on the side of his face. And three, he has the black katana that his father showed him when he was teaching him a lesson about great power requiring great amounts of responsibility. So for all intents and purposes, Chihiro has grown up and not in a fun way. In fact, in his current iteration, which I believe will be his look for the entirety of the manga, he kind of looks like Yuta from JJK. But our first look into Chihiro and Mr. Shiba in the post-time skip era opens with them having a conversation of Mr. Shiba saying that Chihiro knows he could get the scar in his face removed, which confuses me because in like 1910 or 1890, they definitely didn't have that technology. So we might be in like a Naruto situation here where they had modern day technology, but not guns, which when you consider what katanas are able to do, and we'll cover that in a little bit, I guess kind of makes sense. But it's at this point that Chihiro reveals to us that he's not going to be your gone type of MC. He's not going to be Naruto. He's not going to be Goku. He's not going to be trying to talk people out of their bad habits. See, because it's at this point that Chihiro says, I know it could get rid of this scar. I just don't want Want to. Because every morning when I wake up to wash my face, I see this scar and a new wave of fresh fury washes over my body. So we don't have your standard shonen friendship and happiness MC. We more have your standard seinen, I'm gonna kill everybody and everything MC. Think early Thorfinn, Guts, Yuji in modern day JJK. And just as soon as they're done talking about ways to keep yourself angry 24 seven, their train arrives in the town, which is now currently being controlled by the Korogumi Yakuza. At which point, Chihiro and Mr. Shiba see that the Korgumi Yakuza has hung up four people who rallied against them and tried to drive them out of the city or town or whatever. I don't really know how big it is, but the reason that the Yakuza has hung up these four people is to send a message to everybody in the town that if you try to battle against us, you will be made an example of. And thus you can see on the faces of everybody in the town that they've given up, that they understand that the Yakuza is in charge and the best way to stay alive is to not question them. Now, this is Chihiro's first time into town. So Chihiro, upon arriving at the train station, was wondering whether or not the leader of the Yakuza would be a reasonable person to talk to. Essentially, Chihiro was trying to find a way to resolve his beef, and we don't understand why he has beef with the Yakuza, but boy oh boy do I have a couple of guesses without having to cut each and every single one of them down. However, in the next scene in the manga, 
and Chihiro gets the cut in each and every single one of them down. Because nothing really destroys the idea that these guys might be reasonable than hanging four people for putting up posters. So Chihiro and Mr. Shiba find out where the Yakuza are hanging out. And pretty much as quickly as they get there, they get to cutting. Mr. Shiba throws a sword that slices through the neck of one of the Yakuza members. And Chihiro pulls the sword out of that guy's neck and decapitates everybody else at the table. This is where the manga starts to get interesting. After we see Chihiro cut off four people's heads simultaneously, we're then serve to a look on the inside of the Yakuza's hideout, where they're still interrogating the one guy left of the crew that put up all the posters, and they find out that he has a little sister, and they're gonna go find his little sister to make him give up information about the people he's working with. And just as they open the doors to their hideout to go find that small child, the guy who opens the door gets slashed across the chest. Chihiro then proceeds to cut down the three people that were standing by this guy, and were served to, quite honestly, one of the colder panels I've seen in the first chapter of a manga ever. And this is a blacked out version of Chihiro with only his eyes visible, standing in a scene of visceral gore of the people that he just sliced and diced. And in this moment, he reminds me a lot of Zombie Man from One Punch Man. After he's cut down these four Yakuza members at the front of the hideout, Mr. Shiba tells everybody inside of the Yakuza hideout who Chihiro is. That is to say that he tells all of them that Chihiro is the son of Kunishige Rukahiro, the legendary swordsmith capable of making swords that nobody else could. And it's at this point that we get a good look into what's going to motivate Chihiro throughout the duration of this manga, as he tells the members of the Yakuza that he wants to ask them something, and that also, he as a swordsmith cannot let them wield katana. See, it appears as though Chihiro holds the lesson that his father taught him about how the swordsmith carries all of the burden of the souls taken with the swords that they create very close to his heart. And therefore, the concept of anybody using katanas in evil ways makes Chihiro very mad. And therefore, his core motivation outside of avenging what was probably the loss of his father will also be to make sure the katana aren't wielded by evil men and women. Obviously, the Yakuza, not super stoked about an 18-year-old kid killing a bunch of their members, so they all pull out the katanas that Chihiro believes that they shouldn't have and rush him. It's at this point that it's revealed that Chihiro has two separate swords, kind of like your standard samurai or ronin, as your standard samurai or ronin would have a standard katana, but also would wield a shorter blade, which is called a wakizashi. Now, prior to this moment, Chihiro had been using his wakizashi, his shorter blade. However, as all of these members of the Yakuza began to rush him, he switched to his katana, which is the black katana that his father gave him. And as Chihiro begins to pull out his katana, it's revealed to us that the reason that the katanas that his father made were special weren't because they were sharper or more durable, but because Chihiro's father was able to imbue his katanas with sorcery. And thus, the blades that Chihiro's father made were imbued with special powers. Not just the special power of being sharper and more durable than everybody else's swords. And therefore, upon the drawing of his katana and the muttering of the word Enten, Chihiro summons the three goldfish that his father bought for him. As in order to depict that his father was a silly, goofy kind of guy, his father bought Chihiro and him three goldfish. One black, one gold, and one tricolored. Now, technically, upon Chihiro unsheathing this blade and saying Enten, we only see two goldfish, which could either mean that this is in Chihiro's full form, or that he's unable to use the gold goldfish. Or it could just mean that the mangaka wanted to be able to show off as much of the goldfish as possible, and fitting three goldfish into a scene at that size would have been very difficult. Now, honestly, I'm more leaning towards the fact that Chihiro was unable to use the red or gold goldfish, as Chihiro's father states that the red slash gold goldfish is supposed to bring good fortune, while the black goldfish is supposed to ward off evil, and the tricolored goldfish is supposed to be just spectacular. And so it's a possibility that Chihiro's heart is steeped in so much anger and malice that he's not able to use the red goldfish because it only brings good fortune. And therefore, he's using the black goldfish, which wards off malice, and the tricolored goldfish because we don't know what it actually does yet. And upon releasing this sword and his goldfish, Mr. Shiba once again acts as an exposition vehicle, stating that this was Chihiro's father's last katana, the one he gave his life to make. Which confirms to us what we all knew the second we saw Chihiro's scars, that his father was dead. In fact, the second that his father was introduced, I knew he was gonna die. However, if this is the last sword that Chihiro's father ever made, unless Chihiro's father made this sword before showing him the sword in the room in the basement to teach him the lesson about responsibility, that means that the sword that Chihiro is wielding that allows him to summon his goldfish actually isn't the sword that his father showed him. Now, there is a possibility that his Wazikashi is the sword that his father showed him, but it's a manga, it's black and white, a lot of the swords look the same. Regardless, Chihiro is able to use abilities like his black, which takes his black goldfish and allows him to slash an entire room of Yakuza members 
in half. And thus Chihiro goes on a rampage that's eerily reminiscent of the first chapter of Demon Slayer meeting the first chapter of Chainsaw Man. Because obviously Chihiro is using supernatural sword skills, very similar to what Gyu does in chapter one of Demon Slayer. However, these abilities appeared to actually manifest. Though when we were all reading chapter one of Demon Slayer, we believed that these abilities actually manifested. But instead of fighting against one person, Chihiro was cutting down an entire room of people, eerily reminiscent to what Denji does in chapter one of Chainsaw Man. And after Chihiro is done using his black to cut down a ton of Yakuza members, he switches to his other goldfish, Nishiki. Now, Nishiki is the Japanese word for brocade, and that's not an arcade where they sell $1 beers. See, a brocade is a richly colored, highly decorated fabric, and that fabric is usually silk, with patterns raised in either gold or silver thread. Imagine, like, the fanciest material with a bunch of different colors you can imagine. Brocade is usually used to make dresses or kimonos of the highest quality, and thus the tricolor goldfish being referred to as Nishiki is not only a reference to its beautiful tricoloration, but is also a reference to a famous downtown shopping center in Kyoto, Nishiki Market, where one, back in this time, would have bought in something like goldfish. And thus, through the power of his black and his Nishiki, Chihiro is able to cut down everybody in the Yakuza, leading to one of the gorier first chapters that I can remember. That is, in manga, not written by Tatsuki Fujimoto. And after cutting down everybody in the Yakuza, except for the mustachey leader guy, Chihiro goes on to ask him what he knows about the Hisaku, who are apparently the group of sorcerers that back this wing of the Yakuza. Now, the Hisaku is also kind of a hilariously non-discreet thing to call a group of sorcerers that exist in secret, because Hisaku in Japanese quite literally means secret plans or measures, and thus the trope of understanding Japanese and reading a manga or watching an anime and just realizing all of the names are lazy puns continues. Chiro tells Mustashi Man, who's telling him that he's crazy for even looking for the Hisaku, that he's very clearly not sane as he just killed about a hundred people, and that it doesn't matter who the Hisaku are because he needs to cut them down. And thus ends the first chapter of the most widely hyped manga I've ever seen. So now that we know what happens and why it happens and some of the behind the scenes on why certain things were named to be what they are, did the chapter live up to the hype? Do I believe that it's worth a read? Do I think it's going to get a long manga run? Do I believe it's going to get an anime one day? And to all of those questions, I answer with a overwhelming yes. This manga will run to completion. It will get an anime one day, and it is mostly worth reading. See, here's the thing. I believe that if you have the Shonen Jump app, you fall into one of two camps. There are the Wild Strawberry, Undead Unlock, Fire Punch, and Chainsaw Man readers. People who enjoy when a manga tries to break out of the standard, typical, formulaic pattern in which we see a lot of manga fall into, while also trying to break out of that pattern by encompassing their entire story in more gore than you can handle. And I believe that those people will find a lot of the things that they like in this story. As when it comes down to first chapters, this first chapter has about as much gore in it as Chainsaw Man or Fire Punch. The other type of people who have the Shonen Jump app are the people who love formulaic shonen. These are your Black Clover, Fire Force, Dawn to Dawn, and JJK readers. By the way, I'm aware that Fire Punch and Dawn to Dawn aren't on Shonen Jump. These are manga that do the formulaic shonen thing, but do it really well. And there's nothing wrong with your story being formulaic so long as you do the formula really well. There's a reason the formula exists, because it's entertaining. And there are also so be some entertainment in this story for that section of manga readers. I believe this anime does a really good tightrope walk between being incredibly formulaic, as it's about a revenge story and a boy with an enchanted katana, and breaking the mold a little bit by making the main character an unrepentant sociopath hell-bent on cutting down anybody between him and his goal. There will be no switching to a gentle water-breathing style to cut off this demon's head because it had a sad backstory moment. This entire manga, if I'm correct, will be full to its eyeballs with gore as Shiro cuts his way through anybody and anything that gets in his way on his path to revenge. But at the same time, I feel as though this manga has a fair amount of Bleach-esque humor on the way. Not overtly funny, but entertaining enough. And considering the fact that this story revolves around enchanted katanas, I think one of the closest facsimiles to compare this story to will be Bleach, as there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that a large part of the story will revolve around Chihiro recollecting all of the sword that his father made that fell into the hands of the wrong people. And thus, I think this story is going to be about Chihiro finding more and more powerful people with more and more powerful katanas and cutting them down one after one, until eventually he'll be able to avenge the loss of his father, which probably came at the hands of the Hisaku, and recollect all of his father's lost works. I also think there's going to be a large undertone of Chihiro trying to find that red goldfish, and Chihiro becoming the boy that his father wishes he could have been. And because we as a society are so obsessed with the bad guy, good guy nowadays, I mean, look at Denji, Yuji, Eren, the Chihiro is going to maintain the level of popularity that he already somehow has. But do I think that the hype for this manga is going to fall off a cliff? 
absolutely. There's no way it could maintain the level of hype it's currently holding on to. That would be next to impossible. But do I think it has the capability to exist in the top three of current manga? Actually, yeah. One Punch Man is in, well, let's just say, a pretty serious slump. As we're in the middle of a long, drawn-out political arc about the Neo heroes popping up and dissolving the Hero Association, Black Clover just went to Jump Giga, so we're only getting four chapters of it a year. MHA will be done within six months at most. JJK has a fair shake at being done within a year. Don Didon, one of the most popular manga on Earth, isn't on Shonen Jump. Undead Unlock is the least talked about 175-chapter manga, maybe of all time. And Chainsaw Man is also kind of in a weird little slump right now in its whole Chainsaw Man church arc. I genuinely see Kagurabachi being able to bang with the likes of JJK in One Piece for the foreseeable future, because the biggest barrier of entry is reading chapter one, and millions of people are currently reading its chapter one. And considering that its chapter one had a little bit of something for everybody, I see Kagurabachi holding on to a fair amount of readers. But what do you guys think? Have you read Kagurabachi? Did this video convince you to read Kagurabachi? Tell me in the comments below, and while you're down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, hit that noti bell. You know it's great? By the time that this video is out, chapter two will be out, and maybe chapter two will be horrifically bad, and the hype around this manga will be dead completely.